Hi, I'm Kurt Loder. Welcome to Ultra Madonna Weekend here on MTV. All the specials, all the videos, all the Madonna you can possibly handle. And then at 10 tonight, even more on our ultrasound special Inside Madonna, in which we follow her into the recording studio for the making of her great new album, Ray of Light, which will be released this coming Tuesday, and which you should hear as soon as humanly possible. Well, let's get right to it now. Breakfast with Madonna, a special shot in Tokyo in 1990, coming up next. The date was a Friday the 13th in April of 1990. The event was the opening concert on Madonna's Blonde Ambition World Tour, and the location was Tokyo. The conversation was about controversy, concerts, and control over love and life. Here is Breakfast with Madonna. I just think it's better to, you know, to have humor, that's all. Yeah. A sense of humor. And not take yourself too seriously. Do you believe in love? Hi, I'm Kurt Loder. Welcome to Breakfast with Madonna. Not breakfast right here and now, actually. This is more like a light tea. What happened was we were in Tokyo last April when Madonna launched her 1990 world tour. It was a Friday the 13th. The first concert was held at a brand new open air stadium about two hours outside of Tokyo, and it poured rain. Not the best of conditions, actually, and frankly, prospects for a post show interview looked pretty bad. But then back in Tokyo after the show, well past midnight, we got a call. Madonna would, in fact, grace us with her presence. So we hustled over to her hotel suite all the way across town, and there came upon the most remarkable scene. The room we were ushered into was filled with wreathing, bare-chested male dancers, all gyrating wildly to some booming dance pop track on a stereo. In the middle of all this, up on a coffee table, stood Madonna herself, wearing boxer shorts and a black bra, and flailing away with equal abandon. Well, at least we knew we were in the right place. So we went into another room, set up all our cameras, and about an hour later, Madonna, having apparently exhausted all of her dancing companions, appeared in our doorway, wearing a relatively demure bathrobe. She took a seat on a couch, ordered a cup of tea, and off we went. <clears throat> just tell people I just woke up. <laughs> yeah. We had breakfast with Madonna. I'm breakfast having my morning tea. <laughs> I feel so rested. <laughs> we started out talking about religion. Madonna was raised Catholic, and Catholic themes have been woven through much of her work. Most recently, the video for Like a Prayer, which so upset her former tour sponsor, Pepsi Cola, and the actual liturgical touch of Act of Contrition on the Like a Prayer album. Given all of this, and the outlines of Madonna's fairly well-known social life, we were wondering, does Madonna still consider herself a Catholic? Do you still think of yourself as a Catholic? Sort of. A fallen Catholic. Yeah. I mean, did, did you get any like hate mail or anything like that for doing act of contrition or well, not hate mail but I mean did you get if I did no one gave it did to your me. aunts like call you up or anything like that no no my relatives never call me up and say they didn't like something I suppose if they don't like it they just gave it to themselves mm -hmm. That's good. but you, you don't go to church or anything anymore right? no I'm not a practicing Catholic but once you're a Catholic you're, you're always, always a Catholic, Catholic right? as you know Kurt <laughs> Actually, that's true, but, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> okay. I wanted to ask you about Oh Father, which I think is like the most amazing video. Has your dad seen this? I mean, did he have any response to all this? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't know if he's seen it. I'm kind of afraid to call him up and ask him. Really? Yeah. I mean, is it, is it, is it a character, is, is there other character aspects to it? It's not like your life line for line or? No, 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 it's not, but it's, a lot of stuff in the story is drawn from my life. I mean, um, it's a combination of my, my father and, and other men that I've known. So. Okay. And you haven't talked to him since about this? I've talked to him all the time, but yeah. I mean, there, it's sort of unspoken and we don't really... My father doesn't call me up and say, hey, I just saw your video on MTV. I mean, he never does yeah. that. Yeah. He just kind of tries to treat me like all my brothers and sisters. And, that must be <clears throat> difficult, I would imagine. No. Well, he does it. <laughs> Have you heard from any other people that crop up on the album? I mean, you're talking about a lot of stuff in your life, and people say, you know, I saw myself no. in that song. Or... Um, I, I mean, I, yes, I hear, I mean, people that, actually people I don't really know say I could really relate to them. Stuff. Yeah. No one really close to me. Yeah. Do you find that around the world? I mean, if you're in Japan, do you have kids coming up saying, well, it would be hard to understand, I suppose. Not in Japan, huh? No one's really spoken to me in Japan. Really? I just stare a lot. It's <clears throat> a lonely life, that's awful. 
the, the greatest advertising hoo-ha of all time was your Pepsi deal. This was fantastic. You sign this deal, you do your you do your video, you do their little thing, everything's done, you get this tour support, I suppose, and then the video comes out and they go nuts. I mean, what was that all about? Did they just lose their minds or what? Well, I think that they were afraid of the controversy that the video was going to cause. How did they put it to you? I mean, they just did they say, well, we don't like black guys doing this and with white girls, or was there anything like that? Or no, they just... would never be so honest. Hmm. <laughs> they just said they didn't like it. And uh, a couple of people were threatening to um, boycott the bottling companies in yeah. the South. Yeah, but and Donald Wildman, I mean, you know, what are we talking about? Well, I think they were really afraid that this whole thing was going to, like, blow up and they didn't want to do anything to harm. Pepsi, yeah. which is a sort of all-American symbol. Yeah. Were you surprised by this? Or was yeah, this I was, because the video is, I mean, there's a, the, there's a fable in the video, yeah. and it's about, you know, standing up for somebody and telling the truth, and I was shocked that they couldn't see that. <laughs> what they see is what they get. <laughs> they should have known so going in, They should have. I told them about the video. So. How did you describe it? say it's me and this guy and we're I told them what we did yeah. I told them everything yeah. do, do you have a this show really sums up I mean like a prayer album in a way you're doing stuff America's in a very regressive phase and it's very anti it's sort of black and white it's anti-gay it's we've really become going back to the 50s and the stuff you're doing yeah I mean, do you get bad messages from people out there? Do you get any well, I just started. I mean... But I mean, the, well, the, the record has been out. I mean, the songs on the record are, are like that. Do the videos convey that kind of... Um, I know the moral majority is up in arms against me, but... Congratulations. The people, yes. Consider it an achievement. <laughs> but, um, I think that I'm offending, um, certain groups, but I mean, I, I think that people who really understand what I'm doing are offended by it. Because, because it's pro-life, yeah. you know. It's pro, you know, equality. It's pro-humanity. So. I mean, you despair. And that's not really the mood America's in right now. Well, what do you think that is? I mean, how did people come out of the fear 60s? of it's fear of AIDS. I mean, it's just this. I mean, it's like turned everybody into these like '50s monsters, you know. You know. Right. What? No, that's my opinion. That's yeah. why everything's changing. What do you think AIDS has just allowed like the right wing to come in and say, well, see, that's what it leads yes, to? Yes, it has. Yeah. It has, but see, then the people who don't really know that are sort of following onto it and saying, oh, yeah, that's why. You know what I mean? It's a small group of people who are leading people in that direction. Yeah. Is it hard for you to, to try, try and convey these ideas in a stage show and still have like Godier costumes and stuff and be entertaining? Well, <clears throat> I'm not interested in hitting people over the head. I think that, I mean, I, I'm not militant anything, and I don't, I think, I don't want to be pedantic. You know, to me, it's more interesting if you interject humor in all the messages. That way, people get what you're saying, but they sort of get it. I mean, laughing, yeah. you know. I mean, there's irony in everything that I do, so, yeah. in the show. So you're saying, I'll always leave them laughing, kind of thing? Well, I just think it's better to, you know, to have humor, that's all. Yeah. A sense of humor. And not take yourself too seriously. We'll be having some more laughs with Madonna about voguing, among other things, in just a moment, so don't go away. Welcome back to Breakfast with Madonna. During the course of our talk with Madonna after the first show of her world tour in Tokyo last April, we naturally got around to the subject of how she goes about writing songs with her two collaborators, Patrick Leonard and Stephen Bray, the difficulties of performing in a downpour of the sort that greeted her in Japan, and how much she does or doesn't like touring in general. We had run into Madonna's brother, Chris Ciccone, backstage at that show. Chris did some of the stage designs for this tour, but the main reason he was out on the road with his sister this time around, he told us, was, as he put it, who knows if she'll ever tour again to which Madonna's response was as follows. That's what he said he's out here for? Well, he didn't really put it quite mm -hmm. that way, but he led me to believe that, you know, maybe you wouldn't be I, I certainly wouldn't tour in this capacity. I mean, this, this one really wore me out. Why so? Um, was it the rain? Was it the... No, not this show, this yeah. tour. Yeah. This, um, putting it together, because... Um, 
I really put a lot of myself into it. I think it's a real personal statement, and it's it's much more theatrical than anything I've ever done. And uh, I just, I mean, I think that it is a more, much more of a theater piece. No. And and in that respect, um, I mean, I had to pay a lot more attention to detail with set and costume and lighting yeah. and stuff, and it just took a lot out of me. Does everyone get that sort of thing, do you think, around the world? I mean, you're going to be going around the world. Do they understand the concept of theater piece? Do you think the Japanese understand the way Americans do or the French do? I don't know if they're going to look at it and say, oh, this is like theater, but they're certainly going to be um, affected the way I think theater affects you in that, that there's a kind of catharsis like yeah. from beginning to end. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a piece where we don't have to stop you know, at, at the end of every number and yeah. like people applaud. I mean, we could really do the show without audience interaction, which a lot of concerts rely on. So. Yeah. Did you, were you worried tonight? Except if it's raining, <laughs> then I have to sort of ad lib. Maybe you were worried tonight, it's like Friday the 13th, that the rain is pouring down. I, it yeah, I dangerous did. up there or what? It was extremely dangerous, yeah. yeah. I mean, really, you could have, somebody could have fallen off and died or, or broken their leg or Well, something. I have a dancer who's injured right now. She yeah. twisted her ankle in a, a rehearsal, so I was just... I felt like a protective mother through the whole show, watching all the dancers and singers. I mean, I wasn't really paying attention to the audience no. as much as I'd like to, because I just wanted everyone to get through the show and not get hurt. No. You've, become, you've, become a really, you've become a real dancer. I mean, I don't mean to say that you weren't before, mm -hmm. but have you been really been working at that? I mean, it was obvious on this on this tour that... Well, I'm working it in the show. You've really got the stuff, you know? Uh-huh. Thank you. <laughs> but I have been working on it, yes. I mean, do you feel that too, that you really... But it helps. It? I mean, I hired a lot of dancers who were very helpful and collaborative in the choreography. Yeah. And uh, they, I mean, everybody's different in the show. And I think everybody said, okay, now we're going to do this. And so whoever was good on, with that particular style of dancing yeah. worked with everyone else to get it right. Yeah. And you have a dance director, but do you get down with these people and say, well... I want to convey this. I mean, as a matter of fact, yeah. I want to convey stuff where you actually show them steps. Or? Well, no, my contribution was this is how I want to present this song. Mm -hmm. And we put the songs together so that there was an arc, an emotional arc in the show. It starts off this way and it ends this way. And I basically thought of sort of vignettes for every song and how this is what I want to do in this song. Yeah. And then, and I would talk to Vince about the costumes and the feel that I wanted, and then he would fool around with it for a while and then based on um, what song we were doing he would pull a dancer or two who were he thought were good at this kind of stuff and they would yeah. collaborate together and come up with it and then I'd come in and say I like this I don't like that yeah. and oops. I think you're inventing any new dance steps here will you be seeing this stuff on the on the streets anytime soon well I think that a lot of people haven't seen voguing and I think yeah. that that should make an impression on people and I think it'd be great if everybody's starts doing it. I think yeah. it's great. I mean, voguing, voguing was going to be a big thing. It, it was, but it didn't make it, so maybe it will have another chance. Yeah. Why do you think it didn't? Because they didn't have a spokesperson like me. <laughs> <laughs> and why are you promoting it, then? Because I love it. What's so appealing about it? We're trying to get behind voguing. Well, you know what? I, I love it. Also, you know? I think it has a lot of humor to it, too. I mean, yeah. it's just so sort of arrogant and there and presentational, you know what I mean, yeah. self-conscious in a way, and I think it's hilarious. In producing and songwriting, or, you know, you, are you the person who's in charge, or is it a total equal collaboration? I understand, I learned today that you play like guitar and keyboards, and I never knew that. Mm -hmm. uh, an equal collaboration? I suppose in the beginning it is, but in the end, um, I say what goes and what doesn't go. That's because true. So. It's me out there, you know, not Steve and Pat. Yeah. And they understand that. But I mean, do, who could, do you trade ideas back and forth? Do you yeah. come up with melody lines, or is it mostly yeah. lyrics, or? Lyrics and melody lines. And to get inspired for all this, do you got, do you, are you forced to go out to dance clubs a lot? Yeah. No. <laughs> or do you go out to dance clubs a lot? I do, but I'm not forced to. I was just trying to be wry. Yeah. <laughs> rye or pumpernickel. <laughs> Yes, yes, it's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you think, do you think, since you do go out to dance clubs occasionally, mm -hmm. do you see stuff that might be the next to voguing? And you see new stuff coming up? You're on top of this, right? 
Um, you can tell us. Well, quite frankly, I haven't been out in a couple of months because I've been working on the show. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know what's after voguing, but I'll let you know when I find out. Did you have any difficulty uh, convincing Godier to come up with unusual designs for the clothes in the show? Or was he, no, he's, he's very creative. At, and we collaborated on anything. I mean, I actually sent him drawings originally about wh what I wanted, which were the first... I mean, a lot of the costumes were like inspired by my stick drawings. Yeah. And then he kind of elaborated and threw his stuff in. Your stick drawings? Yeah, I'm not a good artist. <laughs> I thought art may have run in the family. It was, you know, no, unfortunately, stuff. and mm. all my brothers and sisters are good that way except uh, me. I see. Okay. So, this is my compensation. <laughs> Okay, we're going to take a little pause right now because even at breakfast with Madonna, there are still commercial breaks, right? Over the course of our early morning conversation with Madonna in Tokyo last April, the talk inevitably turned to questions of love and marriage, her failed marriage to actor Sean Penn in particular. These thoughts were suggested by a song on her Like a Prayer album called Till Death Do Us Part, and here's what Madonna had to say about it. I wanted to ask you about Till Death Do Us Part too. I mean, are you, are you, do you still believe that you know, love is a possibility? I mean, are you, you're not soured on the whole concept. Well, okay, this is my I'm sorry. But, I mean, do you think of it differently now than you did? Well, that was a point of view in the song. Yeah. I mean, that you just keep going back for more shit. Um, no. I'm just, I was just sort of describing a situation, not. Yeah condoning it. You know. But I mean, you don't feel soured by no. an experience that millions of people go through all the no. time? No. Yeah. No. Absolutely not. <clears throat> Have you found love again? Have I found love again? Yes. Yes. Many times. Since then? Many times since then. <laughs> really? Uh -huh. Gee whiz. God, what an enterprising woman. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what they say. You had said once when you were doing when you were doing Speed the Plow, you, you were dandling some babe on your knee, I think, a child, you know, and say, well, this is my next project. I don't know if you remember this or not, like, the Madonna I, baby. I was in a capricious mood. <laughs> oh, okay. So we shouldn't take that. Well, story. my next project was not that, so. No, it turned out to be a movie and an album, but mm -hmm. I just wondered if you were still, I mean, do you want to have kids at some point? Or? Mm hmm Yeah. Now, my next question is, would they be with Please Warren? don't ask me with uh, This is because Warren Beatty did this interview with Barbara Walters, a really terrible interview, but he did this interview and he said he wants to have kids too. And I just, well, naturally the question would arise, you know, would you be having them together perhaps? Well, I just really can't comment on that. <laughs> I felt I had to try. I don't know. Uh huh. Is there, have you got, is there a different sort of sort of persona in the, in the songs for Dick Tracy and the film also? I mean, is it a new Madonna It's Yeah, thing? It's, well, it's inspired by the movie, yeah. so it's kind of in character, my breathless character yeah. from the movie, so yeah. Hello? You're breaking and entering, you know. Sorry. Sit down. Are you going to arrest me? If I were going to arrest you, I'd have done it by now. Then what are you up to, honey? I think Lips Manless is dead. And I want you to tell me who killed him. Or maybe you weren't on his side. Whose side are you on? The side I'm always on. Mine. No grief for Lips? I'm wearing black underwear. You know, it's legal for me to take you down to the station and sweat it out of you under the lights. I sweat a lot better in the dark. I know how you feel. You don't know if you want to hit me or kiss me. I get a lot of that. Look, you're safe. Big boy's in jail. You're the one that can keep him there. Give me a call. The first song in the show is... Um, a Stephen Sondheim song, mm -hmm. and then the other two I wrote, trying to keep in the period vein with a sort of modern yeah. feel to it. So, and but there's I don't know, twelve songs in the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what the, the album that I'm breathless is going to be? Like all stuff I did, Tracy, or what? Well, some of the songs are in the movie. The rest are just inspired by 
the movie itself, yeah. the period aspect, the cartoon aspect, the gangsters, you know, the characters, and and who I was in the movie. Yeah. Why Stephen Sondheim, besides the fact he's like, that's a great songwriter, but I know you're a long time fan. Did you know him? I know him now. I didn't really, I knew who he was before I did the movie, but I was introduced to him and worked with him and, yeah. you know, I really respect him. What attracted you to this? Were you a Dick Tracy? Yeah. I don't think it was you. What attracted me to it? Yeah. A good part in a good movie. Yeah. I mean, a chance to work with a lot of great talents. Yeah. But is it, is it, does it resemble, you know, any blondes you've done previously? No. Like, who's that it, girl? No. Or? This movie looks like nothing anyone's ever seen. In what way? Can you, you just preview it for it us? By now? No. It just oh. looks incredible. Come on. It's like a 3D cartoon, but it's real. It's you can sink your teeth into it. Wow, that does sound good. We'll go see it. <laughs> plug, plug, plug. Okay. Okay. And now I have to eat my breakfast. Don't, don't.